Ferguson. I am the chair of the Concord Planning Board, and I'm calling this public meeting to order at 7.01 p.m. In accordance with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Executive Order of March 12, 2020, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, we are conducting this meeting virtually, and this meeting is being recorded. Uh, before this meeting begins, I've been asked to make the following statement for the NMI Starmet Reuse Committee. Um, I'm just going to, you mind if I share my screen just to um, show that while I'm giving the statement. It is, this one, and then I'll stop sharing. Uh, the Nuclear Metals Starmet Reuse Planning Committee, that's the NSRC, has been working for the past year to assist the town with identifying ways to reuse, repurpose uh, the property at 2229 Main Street for maximum public benefit. Based on the initial outreach, the committee's own deliberation and feedback from the Concord Select Board, potential redevelopment in several reuse zones have been identified and a preliminary concept plan for the site was prepared. Reuse includes over 20 acres of open space and up to 23.7 acres for potential new development. At this time, the committee believes the redevelopment of, re of reuse zone A1, which if you can see my screen, looks like it's in the center of that property. The redevelopment of reuse zone A1 and conservation open space designation of reuse zone C are best for those areas. <clears throat> the committee remains neutral on the potential for reuse or redevelopment of other A zones, that's A2, A3, and A4 and is seeking community input on six key questions. The challenge is getting the word out and inviting those comments. The public outreach document with questions is available on the town's NMI StarMet webpage, along with the final report prepared by SCIO, which goes into more detail about the specific process and work to date. The document will be sent to town boards and committees for their input, and the community is also invited to respond to the six questions listed in the outreach documents. Please send your comments to NMI Starmet Reuse at ConcordMA.gov. And so I believe that the six questions are on this page here. So people can read the information, check out the drawings, and then respond to the, to the six questions here. So thanks to that group for sharing that information. We want to help get the word out as well and get as much public comment as we can. Um, Elizabeth, do you know, and it might say on this page, the deadline for public comment when they are hoping to get it by? You Let me know? check, just okay. give me a second. So we'll, um, if we find that, we, we can put it in the, maybe in the Q&A or something too. So now for the planning board agenda. Um, the first item on the agenda is a presentation from MAPC regarding the Thoreau Depot redevelopment project. Senior regional planner, Chris, Koshal, I'm sorry if I'm saying that wrong, I should have asked you while I was on the line first, will be allowed to share the, his screen to provide a presentation of a synthesis of community feedback from the February 11th public forum, a draft vision and draft recommendations for zoning and other elements. <clears throat> he is looking for feedback from the board and the public so that the vision and recommendations can be refined and a first draft of a, a zoning bylaw can be developed. So that's what our goal is today, is to, we're gonna give the, chance, the board a chance to ask questions after the presentation. And then after the board asks those initial questions, I will then ask for public comment. So we all understand the challenges of these virtual public forums, and we'll do our best to make this as inclusive as possible. We definitely wanna hear your feedback. The public is invited to view the meeting as an attendee. So everybody that's called in right now, um, we can see you as attendees. Uh, we can't have you have video access, but we should be able to hear your questions. So if you have a question during the public comment period, uh, use the Q&A function, and you'll need to type in your name and address before you type in your question so that I can read it and include it in the record of the meeting. Or you can use the raise hand function, and I will, um, we can unmute one attendee at a time so, they can, uh, so we, you can ask your question. If you are calling in, participating through the phone, you can press star nine to raise your hand. And there's a Q&A function, so if you have other questions about that process, let us know. At this time, I'm gonna ask for a roll call vote of the planning board members. So let's see who we have, um, Ms. Orbital. You just unmute yourself and say if you are here or present. 
Present. Uh, Mr. Bosdet. Present. Mr. Johnson. Present. Mr. Flint. Present. And Mr. Saya. Present. All right, so I think that takes care of the initial business and we are looking forward to hearing uh, the presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. I will share my screen now. Um, okay. okay, so I think you all can see that. Let's see, enter full screen. Okay. Well, again, th thanks for having me. I know this is uh, sort of in some ways a challenge to, to conduct our meetings this way. So I appreciate um, taking the time. I should also mention, I, I know we have a lot to get through, so I'll, I'll try to be as efficient as, as I can be. Um, and I, when I scheduled tonight's meeting, I, I forgot that today is my wedding anniversary. So my wife said, this better be worth <laughs> it. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I will uh, try to make it so. Also want to welcome uh, my colleague Ella Wise is um, also joining us. Um, she, we've been working closely on this. Um, so when we get to the Q&A part, she, she may jump in um, as well. So this is our second forum that we've had now for this project. So what I'm going to do tonight is give a, a recap of what this, the purpose of this project is. Um, and then we'll get into what we heard at, at the first forum, which was um, a well attended forum. We got a lot of feedback. We took that information and then we've, we've drafted um, a, a vision and then recommendations to try and achieve that vision. And so we'll go through that and, and see sort of what we got right, what we're missing, et cetera. So I think there's three broad goals for this project. Um, this is a, a recap from the first forum, but we are developing a vision for this area, the Throw Depot area. And then we're creating what I'm calling a framework, um, which really means the zoning. That's the main focus of this project is to draft a zoning bylaw that can help implement the vision. Um, it's one component. It's one of the, I'd say, most important components. Um, but again, it's a framework in the sense that it doesn't ne necessarily mean that development would, will occur, um, but it, it allows the type of development that the town sort of wants to occur. And then finally, we're, we're also touching upon at a high level um, a number of other recommendations that we've we heard through the vision um, forum um, that I think are important elements to, to help achieve the vision beyond the zoning. I also wanted to mention that this project is really a direct outgrowth, I think, of your recently completed um, long-term master plan. Uh, there were a number of goals within this master plan that really, I think, specifically call to, to um, led to this project um, and, and the goals of this project, such as renewing and improving Concord's village centers, of which the Thoreau Depot area is one of them, facilitating mixed-use development um, and, and improving the public spaces and connectivity, supporting the strong commercial businesses. Of course, this is one of your commercial areas. Uh, creating a range of housing um, for across the range of needs and income levels. And, and I think I would maybe pause and just add on to that, that you know, in this time where issues of, of systemic racism, I think are really brought to the forefront. And I think a lot of us are searching for ways to really be um, sort of actively anti-racist. Um, I think from a planning perspective, changing the zoning to allow for a, a range of housing, I think is one way that we can actually take some concrete steps um, towards achieving that. And then finally, and I, th I know this is also very important, is to preserve the character that a, a, a sort of special place like Concord has. Okay, so this is the study area. Um, it's, it's a fairly small area. We're looking at about 15 acres um, with, that has 28 parcels covering it. The building area, 200,000 square feet, is, is a fairly modest amount of, of um, area that's built up right now. And you can see that there's lots of impervious surface um, within this area, as, as you all probably know. So I think what we did last time, I went through a, a bunch of slides that had existing conditions. So I'm not going to do that now. Um, if people uh, would like to see what was presented before, I know this is posted, the presentation is posted on the town's website. Um, these are a number of just thumbnails of the slides that we went through covering things like what is the existing land use, what are the heights, the densities, some of the assets and challenges in the area, types of things that um, we tried to present to sort of lay the groundwork um, for the next part of the, uh, of the first forum, which was the open house. So what we did was we had a number of stations 
um, the planning board staff um, members staffed uh, the various stations and people could travel to the various stations and provide feedback on things related to economic development issues, connectivity issues, um, what they would like to see in this area, uh, what types of buildings they'd like to see, things of that nature. So I'm going to now just briefly sort of touch on some of the things that we, we heard. Um, like I said at the beginning, we, we had a lot of, um, I think, a, a good attendance. We got a lot of great feedback um, at this forum. This is really just summarizing at, at a very brief and high level. One of the things we did was uh, what's called the visual preference survey. So people picked the types of buildings that they think could fit within in the future of, of this area. So these um, six thumbnails here are the, the top images, top buildings that people chose. Uh, and you can see there's, I think, you know, some commonalities among all of them. Um, all of this is, is fairly traditional architecture that you can see here. Um, pitched roofs, for example, or mansard roofs. Um, most of them, these buildings, four of them have ground floor retail. There's lots of windows. There's some um, sort of what I would call articulation elements in these buildings. Um, so not many blank walls, for example, things such as dormers. Um, I also I would just sort of call out the bottom middle image. Um, that was, again, one of the top images, which was uh, actually a larger building um, among the ones that we chose. But um, people seem to gravitate towards this. This is a, um, as opposed to being mixed use, this is a multifamily building. Um, my sense is what people liked about it was that um, it, it's set back a ways from the road, so it doesn't feel overwhelming. And there's a lot of open space um, that, that sort of accompanies it so that I think sort of helps, uh, what I would say, soften the, the feel of, of that building. And also on the bottom right, people um, like these are um, uh, townhomes, essentially, that um, I think uh, do a, a good job of sort of articulating and, and differentiating among the different homes. Um, and so I think, again, this is something that could be appropriate in, in parts of, of this area. Some of the other things we heard, um, people want more places to eat and drink, more restaurants, for example. Um, people like the daily needs, what I'm calling types of services that you have there, like a pharmacy and um, a grocery st store, um, certainly um, bank, things like that. We also heard that, pe that this area though needs more wayfinding. So um, we heard a lot of people, there are a lot of visitors that come to Concord, they take the train, they arrive, they get off the station, um, you're fairly close to, to Con Concord Center, for example, um, but there's not really a good way to, to get there that people know necessarily. So there's some confusion and, and having wayfinding can, can help with, with that. And then people want a lot more of things like open space and outdoor seating. Um, and then there's a lot of elements related to the pedestrian um, sort of experience. So having it be safer for pedestrians, um, pedestrians, and, and when I say that, I think it's important to note that pedestrians um, come in a lot of forms um, in terms of ages and abilities. So I think they, that was something that was really sort of underscored of what people wanted was to ensure that it's safer for all users of the roadway. Um, and then there were also some vehicular um, issues. People wanted some of these roads to ensure that they weren't cut through, road, uh, cut through roads. Um, and that's what we could call traffic calming, ensure they, tr um, cars travel slowly, um, as well as improving the um, safety of some of the intersections. So we took all of that information, again, that was sort of a summary of, of a lot that we heard, and we then started to articulate the vision. And we do this in a few ways. Um, first, we start with what's called a vision statement. Um, so it's, it's really a, a paragraph, or in this case, a couple paragraphs that help articulate it. Um, I think what, rather than reading this whole thing here, I think what probably makes more sense is that this presentation, if it's not now, will be posted on the town's website. So I would invent by members of the public to, to read it um, at their leisure. Um, I have my email at the end and people can, can send comments to see if we sort of need to do some wordsmithing or if we're missing things um, that we need to add or got, got some things wrong. Um, I think a couple highlights just to sort of mention, you know, people again really want this area to sort of fit with Concord in terms of the built environment and, and, and the development. Um, it should continue to be an asset for Concord's residents, but also a gateway for, for visitors. Um, and again, thinking about the fact that this is a commercial area and we wanted to ensure that it's, it's vibrant, it has a diversity of, of businesses. 
Um, and then a, a strong emphasis, again, as I mentioned, on the pedestrian realm and um, both the comfort and the safety of the pedestrian for the pedestrians. And when I say pedestrians, I'd also add bikers in that because we did get a lot of people mentioning um, the needs for bicyclists as well. Then sort of the next level is taking that paragraph um, of the vision statement and then um, talking about some principles. So these principles, again, I won't read this now, you can look at them, but they take elements that I had just mentioned that are within the vision statement and then give a little bit more detail in terms of, of what we're talking about. So when we talk about commercial uses, we're, we're thinking especially of the ground floor and, and having these commercial spaces um, be available for smaller um, local businesses, things like that, just as an example. All right, so now, Final step in terms of this vision, which I have a, a handful of slides, um, and again, I'll, I'll go through these quickly and then people can kind of go back and, and try to digest it. For those of you at home right now who are maybe multitasking, uh, this is a, a good chance, I'd say, just to check in um, because I, I, one thing I, I really want to underscore here is that this is a, a hypothetical example. This is not a development proposal um, in the works by any means. This is an example that tries to show how the vision could play out um, on one site um, and, and that's sort of compatible with the vision and help achieve some of the goals. So this site that we chose, this is um, where the Crosby Marketplace is. Um, so I'll give you a second just to sort of orient yourself um, in terms of that this is along Sudbury, um, Sudbury Road. And so the top is the existing conditions. Um, the site is actually two parcels, but it's outlined with that heavy black um, line. And then the bottom shows an example of how this area could be redeveloped. Um, the white buildings are, again, hypothetical buildings. So if you take a moment and just notice from this bird's eye view, um, you know, look at the building footprints, for example, you can see where the buildings are located is, is clearly changed. Buildings are brought up closer towards the street. Um, that's one of the elements that we think is often very important for um, in, enhancing walkability in a mixed use center. Um, the total footprint area actually is fairly similar to what's existing there, but um, they do have, as opposed to being single story buildings, we now have multiple stories. So I'll go into a little bit more detail from this, um, this example. So if we zoom in, um, so this example had three buildings that were fit. Um, you can see the first one on the left, that's about 4,400 square feet of ground floor commercial space with seven units above. The second building that is actually sort of long, um, the narrow side faces the street um, is a bigger, uh, 5,800 square feet could fit 10 residential units. So to, to do this model, you know, we made assumptions in terms of how big the, the residential units are. So again, this is an example, this could, could certainly change. Um, the other thing I would mention is that we took into account um, what is the parking to see could parking actually fit. Um, we assumed in this case that it was all ground floor parking. Um, in some cases, they, they could be structured parking um, often associated with the residential that, that could maybe be built. Um, that would, of course, be up to the developer to, to decide on that and see if that's financially feasible. But we wanted to show it in this way, which is a, a lower cost method, and, and see what could fit in this area when you take into account the parking, um, because the parking is often one of the biggest limitations to how much can be built um, on a site. The third building, the bottom building, this is the, obviously the largest one. This essentially preserves the footprint of the Crosby, um, Crosby's marketplace and then adds housing on top of that. Um, and then finally, um, number four that I put there, this is an example of, of open space where we assumed that the site had to have 15% open space. Um, this is kind of the biggest portion of it that you're seeing right there. Um, and I think one of the things that we heard was that people would like for this to be sort of publicly accessible open space. So even if it's still um, the, the developer's land, um, it's provided um, as, a, as an asset to the community. 
couple more details in terms of the, I guess, the urban design of, of this area and the makeup. Again, um, that you can see the orientation that the buildings are, are brought closer to the street, um, and that helps sort of create a bit of a, a little bit of a nascent block structure. And this all helps enhance that combined with um, the sidewalks and, and pedestrian amenities, help create sort of a walkable environment. That, that's, I think, one of the key goals that came out of the first forum was really enhancing the walkability, um, which, which goes beyond just having sidewalks to, to actually being a place that people want to walk. In. And this is, um, I think, one of the ways that you can help, um, help achieve that. People also, as I just mentioned, wanted a lot of outdoor space. Um, so in addition to sort of the big kind of biggish park area on the left side of the screen, um, there's also um, some other spaces within the, distributed within the site. And kind of going closer now to the ground um, and sort of what it would be like in terms of the pedestrian experience. This type of site is an opportunity to really widen the, the sidewalks and the pedestrian area. Um, when you have the room, um, sidewalks should be um, quite wide and, and really almost divided into sort of three sections. So along the curb, along the street, um, we call that the furnishing zone. That's where you can have your street trees and your um, lighting and trash receptacles that provide sort of a buffer from the roadway itself. Um, and then there's a walking zone and that's usually should be at, at least five feet. And then what I'm calling the active zone, and, and that's an area that would have, could have seating for outdoor seating um, associated with a restaurant or, or cafe with it. Um, and the setback that I, I put into this model, um, I have 18 feet from the public right of way. Um, and that's fairly similar to what's in, um, in the adjacent existing building. So it sort of, it respects, I guess, the context of what's there today. Um, and it also provides a buffer from Sudbury, which is a, a fairly, um, you know, high speed roadway. Um, but I think one of the critical things is that this front setback area needs to be um, used for things that are pedestrian oriented, so not parking. I think that's something that is, um, especially coming from the visual preference survey, as well as just sort of best practices for creating walkable environments. Um, I think that's, I would argue, fairly critical. Um, and also, I, I would just mention one other thing is that this sort of 18 foot setback, I think that's appropriate in this part of the study area. Other parts like along Thoreau Street itself, um, that, that wouldn't be likely because those are much smaller parcels. Today, the, the, um, the buildings meet the sidewalk um, and, and I would probably want to continue in the future. Um, one of the things, you know, zoning increasingly starts to think about um, the design elements. I, traditionally, we looked at just heights and, and very broad sort of um, what I would call blunt instruments controlling the design. Um, but increasingly, um, bylaws are, are including elements that are a little more prescriptive in terms of what people want. And so I think this is an example that I, and that's why I'm pointing out some of the elements um, on this diagram. For example, the fact that people seem to really gravitate towards pitched roofs, um, that, that can be put into the bylaw itself. Um, Things that I'm calling building components, such as dormers, um, that again, that sort of adds you know, some articulation and interest to the building, and it also increases the, the usable space of a building, which is also fairly important because we're not talking about very large um, buildings um, in general. There are also ways to, for buildings that are longer, to sort of break it up visually so it doesn't seem like such a long building, and that can be done through what we're calling vertical uh, modulation or vertical articulation elements. This could be things such as pilasters or it could be slight sort of changes in whether it's the materials or in the, the plane of the buildings themselves. Um, and there are some very successful ways that I've seen um, to, to, to do that. But then on the other hand, another way to do that is just to simply limit the, the building length as it faces the street. And I think that in an area like Concord, that could also be um, appropriate. And then finally, um, another element that people um, and bylaws I've seen um, included often has to do with requirements for the ground floor glazing, basically how much of that ground floor needs to be windows um, as they face the street, um, something that I think is very important for commercial spaces. 
Uh, I mentioned this um, at the beginning, but I just wanted to sort of underscore that, you know, one of the assets obviously is the um, Crosby's marketplace. Um, a lot of my projects, when we ask what people would like to see in their neighborhood, in their area, it's a grocery store. So you already have that. And so I wanted to sort of be sensitive to that and, and really build upon that and show, again, this is an example. Um, you probably can't see it, but actually, I think I even wrote Crosby's on the, and sort of in the bottom middle, that this assumes that the first floor would be that um, existing sort of marketplace, um, grocery store, um, as well as space for the Ace hardware, um, and then build up on top of that. And so that's what sort of, um, that's what this example shows. Um, the parking with the location of the parking, I mentioned that that's sort of very important. Um, I think we want to prioritize the pedestrian. Um, you know, we still need to have enough parking and we want to make sure that when people park, they can get to the front door. Um, but I think we, we have an opportunity to, to improve what's there, what's there today. All right. So I think I've gone through a lot. Um, that's sort of, I think really what, you know, I think it's sort of as we are at right now in the process, we are wanted to sort of get confirmation and get feedback, I should say, on what the vision is. Um, what we're going to do after this is refine the vision. We'll memorialize this in a report that we will send out. But pretty soon what we're going to now turn our attention to is actually drafting the zoning bylaw itself, which is really the, the key deliverable um, as part of this project. Um, so we will be back here multiple times, I'm sure, with, with iterations of the zoning. Um, but I wanted to hit a couple of the highlights now in terms of what we're thinking. Um, the following slides after this one have a, a fairly detailed um, table um, comparing the existing zoning to sort of some of the proposals that we're thinking of right now. Um, so again, people can feel free to look at this um, um, at their leisure online. Couple of things, so I think we have an opportunity. This is clearly one study area. It's fairly small. It's an existing single zoning district. Um, and I think that should remain so, but I think we have an opportunity to um, create two sub-districts um, so that we'd have a common framework, common language, sort of common goal. But there are some differences within this area. And so we can take that into account both in terms of what we're looking for in the future um, and, and just how to sort of get there. Um, so that's one aspect, and I, I put these names, um, we've called them Thoreau Street Subdistrict, Thoreau Marketplace. These can obviously change. Um, we just sort of put those in as placeholders. Um, so some of the things we want to modify the open space requirements, um, especially I think that's important on large parcels. I think we need to be careful on smaller parcels of, of not requiring too much because um, it might just be, make a, a project not feasible, but on the large projects, I think that's where there's a, a real opportunity. I think we have an opportunity uh, to have some slightly larger buildings as long as they're sort of away from both the residential district, so it doesn't sort of impede upon them, and away from the street um, itself. Um, and that's sort of an example going back to the visual preference where I think people sort of seem to have liked one of those larger projects. Um, the parking, I think we have an opportunity to, you know, parking is critical um, in an area like this. You know, this isn't downtown Boston. We, we need parking, of course, um, but we want to make sure we have the right amount of parking. And I think there are some opportunities to make some modifications there. And then the final piece, as I mentioned, was that um, increasingly um, bylaws have um, sort of more prescriptive uh, requirements as it relates to the design. Uh, of course, we don't want to go overboard and, and be overly prescriptive and, and make a project, again, cost too much. We want to allow flexibility, um, but I, th I think it's important to have some, um, at least some guidelines uh, to, to communicate what the, what the town is, is sort of wanting to see from a project. So I'm not going to go through these tables right here, but again, people can feel free to look at them. These are essentially pre-draft so any you know people can feel free to email if there are things that call out to them that is is just sort of off um of course please let me know the other recommendations you know again as i mentioned these would be at a at a done at a very high level that will memorialize in this report i think these are sort of initiatives that um the town can undertake as, as part of other separate projects um but I would also say that a lot of these recommendations, I think they are very important and critical to, to really help achieve the vision. Um, so I've divided them into two areas, two groups. One has to do with the connectivity. When I say connectivity, I basically mean how do people get around? 
um, it, with an emphasis on how do people get around as pedestrians and, and bicyclists. Um, so there were a number of specific recommendations that people gave um, at the first public forum. So we're sort of essentially memorializing them. And these are a lot of these are things that the, for example, town engineer could, could be working on um, either with a transportation planning firm um, or, or other groups. Um, some of these, I would say, also could make their way into the zoning in terms of, for example, bicycle parking. Um, that, that could be something that could be required for developments um, as well as being in, in, within the, the public realm itself. The other sort of bucket has to do with economic development. Um, and again, these are intended just to be sort of starting points for things that the town working with various stakeholders, whether it's the Chamber of Commerce or other business groups um, or the local businesses within the area could sort of use these as a starting point. Um, the report itself will, of course, have some more um, details in terms of what these sort of might be. Um, but again, we, we wanted to sort of capture that because I think these are important for the helping to achieve the vision. Um, so with that, you know, I think as we, I mentioned several times, we're, we're gonna have this presentation available. Um, people can please send me any comments related to, to this that you see, um, in addition to whatever we, we talk about tonight. Um, my email's here, um, and, and again, you'll be able to find that. Um, so with that, I guess I can stop sharing my screen and I'll, I'll turn it back to the chair. Thank you. Um... I think uh, you did a great job of capturing what happened in February. So I, that was uh, good to see. Let me turn it over to the board to see what questions you all have first. Um, and it's possible we might need to see a slide or two. So just be ready. So anyone from the board uh, want to start with questions? Yeah, one question. Hey. Can you point us to any examples of where this exercise has been done where you, you take it as sort of an existing town center overlay, new, new zoning, so, so you can sort of see how it plays out over time? Um, one place off the top of my head where this, um, they've already adopted the zoning and now have a couple projects going in is Ashland, downtown Ashland. So okay. they have um, a couple, um, 21 Main Street is, is one specific project that I think is a, a really good example that actually would basically fit within um, a place like Concord. Um, so you could, you could look that up because that's completed. It, it has ground floor retail. It has a, a nice little setback where they put outdoor seating. Um, it's, it's two and a half stories, I think. So um, it's working there. Um, what we are actually working with the town of Ashland now is um, they worked on that zoning with, I don't know which consultants several, five years ago. They're now revisiting it and making some modifications um, because they have some projects that they really like. They have another project that they like a little bit less. So we're, we're making some modifications to, to that zoning um, to kind of finesse it a little bit. Okay. And then I guess on, the other question would be on design. Is it, are, you, are you going to be coming up with a, a sort of a list of proposed design standards? Um, again, you know, Pending the feedback that we get, you know, my, what I would probably recommend in this case, I think we would have some design standards as it relates to, for example, roof lines, um, as it relates to building orientation, the percentage of ground floor um, glazing that you have, mm -hmm. um, are there requirements to ensure that you don't have blank walls along the street, um, are, if you have a longer building, you know, more, I'd say probably more than 40 feet, if there needs to be some sort of vertical articulation to, to sort of break it so it doesn't feel like a very long horizontal building. Um, okay. Those are sort of the things we were thinking. So, so dictating in a little bit form, but not style per se. Sounds yes, like. I would call them principles as opposed to style, yeah. Thanks. It seems to me that uh, the proportion and the scale of the retail space is something that you're trying to maintain. It doesn't seem like you've found any need to kind of change uh, that. It was, it's really the addition of uh, residential as well as kind of a create a more walkable uh, space, you know, pedestrian oriented um, that, that is the bottom line here. It, it, because if I look at all the buildings and the kinds of retail that's there and I compare it to what's existing, it does seem almost just directly comparable. We're not trying to expand or reduce uh, the retail component, the commercial component. So, so yeah, what, what I would say is again, this, 
keeping in mind this is hypothetical, right? So the zoning wouldn't dictate that. So if a developer felt like there was a market for more retail, um, this would not prevent um, them from doing that. Um, yeah. what, what we tend to find is, you know, the, the market for retail tends not to be very strong. Um, you know, it takes a lot of um, people to support businesses. Um, and mm -hmm. I think there's not much vacancy there now, but I think there might even be some vacant um, properties within the, within the district today. So I, I was sort of being, again, fairly conservative, assuming that the, the amount of retail probably wouldn't change all that much but again it's just this was just one one example of how this could play out right but in this zone i think that we would require that it would be mixed use not pure residential i i assume or were you proposing that we allow pure residential well you know again this is something that as we get into the details we, we would need to discuss i think you know i think it's um, there are parts to, I think one thing that would be, I would probably recommend is that maybe properties are mixed use, but not necessarily every building has to be mixed use. Um, so, mm -hmm. you know, having sort of the horizontal mixed use, I think, as opposed to, you know, if you have a building, um, it, it's, it can be hard to, to require all buildings if you have multiple buildings to be ground floor retail, um, if there isn't the market. And I think what's important is to ensure that the ground, that the retail is maintained along the main roadways as opposed to being back in the interior of a parcel. But again, this is something that as we move to the next stage, I will be looking to all of the planning board's feedback in terms of how, what you feel is best and comfortable as well as what the feedback that we get from the town. Okay, and one more question if I can is that, uh this is, I think, if we pursue it, the first foray we'd have into anything like form-based code uh, in the town. We haven't really, we, it's very traditional zoning here. So do you have any recommendations about how we could superimpose that for this new district onto our existing zoning bylaw without creating kind of like a Martian landing on earth? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I've, I've seen this done uh, a few different ways. Um, you know, one way that's very, that is in some ways easier is to just make it an overlay district. Um, however, my recommendation um, is that this would be um, a base zoning district. Um, I think that that's cleaner. Um, you know, if that's what you actually want, then that's what you should have the zoning for. Um, and there are ways to do that. And when we get a draft, I can show examples um, off the top of my head, Situate has a form-based code just for their village centers. Um, I think, I think, frankly, their form-based code is way too complex, um, and I don't. I think it goes way overboard. But I think that type of framework could work um, here. Um, same thing with Ashland, the mention that which I just mentioned. Um, Littleton's another one. I don't know if it's been adopted yet, but they've been working on on this. And, and again, mm -hmm. so this, there's there's a number of examples, and the way that these are typically done. Um, as opposed to a place like, I believe, Newton and Somerville, they've done their entire cities redone as a form-based code. Um, what's more common um, and probably more important is, is just having the form-based sort of approach in the sort of the, the downtown or village center areas, the mixed-use areas. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally, I think we'd want it to be kind of a template for how we could implement the other areas in the future as we get to them. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Sure. Other questions from the board? Burton, you're muted. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, just one more question. So, you know, one of the new, you, we're talking about two s sort of sub-districts here you mentioned, um, and we've got the feature that it's bisected by, you know, the, the MBTA track and, and property. Is there anything, I, I, I think, you know, some of the feedback you would have gotten in February related to walkability and, um, you know, the overall district is defined by being sort of defined by that station, the, the, the depot. Um, but does that, if, are there any specific ways you, you think of that train line going through the, between the property that that would impact how we should be thinking about this? I mean, certainly having the train line, that, that can be a challenge. Um, I, I, you know, the zoning can only do so much, I guess, is, is sort of the short answer. And I don't know how much the zoning can really sort of overcome any challenges that sort of that tra rail line sort of causes in the area. So I, I, I'm certainly open to more feedback on that. Um, and, and Ella, feel free to jump in if there were any recommendations um, as they pertain to that in terms of the feedback that there might have been feedback. I can't recall off the top of my head. 
um, if people had sort of ideas for, for the train line itself. I think in terms of the sub-districts, we were sort of thinking along the lines of two things. One was the types of buildings where pe that people did. So the visual preference exercise had not just what buildings people liked, but where they wanted to see them. And there wasn't a whole lot of difference, but there were some differences. Um, and so that was one aspect. And, and the second aspect was because of the fact that along Sudbury, um, you, you have some larger parcels, um, that there's different opportunities, and, and I would say maybe different requirements that should be placed upon those parcels versus some of the real small ones along um, the mm -hmm. road street. Yeah, okay. Just building up on that <clears throat> question about um, walkability, um, I think part of the problem with that, the, that whole area is that uh, from an urban design perspective, the street walls are not well defined. Like it's, it's mostly, especially when you go <clears throat> at the intersection, there are four parking lots, basically. So you have, uh, so uh, in terms of zoning, I think also in terms of connecting the two sub-districts, um, I'm not sure what's uh, in terms of, if there are ways that uh, the zoning can help. I don't know, maybe these gas stations, uh, one of them will uh, change eventually, become something else. So, so that encouraging more, um, that continuity is not there basically. Whatever we do, it's going to be completely separate districts because of it's fairly car centric in terms of the design of it. So it's all, and even, even the, um, the area right after Crosby's Market, now you have that street and then there's this, uh, uh, setback, uh, quite a bit of a setback, and it's a dead zone basically for pedestrians. So, I, I mean, that that continuity becomes very important regardless of the train station, train train line, basically. Well, I fully agree. I mean, that that's clearly one of the limitations. Um, you know, of course, we can't require anybody to redevelop their property to to sort of be compatible with this vision. All we can do is create the framework. So, the example that I gave tried to show how, you know, over time as development occurs, hopefully that sort of that street wall, as you um, termed it, sort of starts to get get filled in. Um, so everything that's within the zoning district would be subject to those requirements um, in terms of um, any future redevelopment. Um, we, we can't force anybody to redevelop, but when it does happen or if it does happen, whether it's in five years from now or 15 years from now, it, it's sort of conducive to sort of being walkable. Thanks. Other other questions from the board? I have a couple of questions, but I want to make sure everybody has gotten to ask. Um, uh, we are going to open this up to uh, public comment and feedback as well right after this. I see people putting questions in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you're putting a question in the Q&A, put your name and your address, please, and your question. Um, and also, just a reminder, I, uh, Chris, I think it was great to kind of have that visualization of what it could look like at least in that area. And, and so for folks on the phone, um, that's just a proposal, uh, or not even a proposal, I'm sorry. It's, it's just a hypothetical what it could look like. What that area actually looks like is up to the property owners based on the zoning that's adopted. And so a couple of questions um, that Elizabeth, you might know the answer to. We were talking about that, that Crosby's part that we looked at for this model is two parcels, correct? And and without, you know, you don't have to answer, but is, do you know if that's owned by one um, one owner or two owners or multiple owners? Just out of curiosity. Um, so the two parcels that he showed, I'm not sure if it's owned by um, two parcels. I know in that whole section by Crosby Markets, I think there's a total of four different owners for all of those buildings. Okay. Um, but I can look at that in um, two seconds and let you know. Okay, well, and just wondering, um, you know, what kind of involvement we are getting for, for Chris to get feedback from existing property owners in that area. Um, because as he said, you know, we can change the zoning, we can invite this, these ideas to create this vision, which is like very exciting for sure, because it, it really seems to be kind of the embodiment of part of the long range plan. Uh, but it's really up to the developers, we can't make the developers redevelop their land. Um, but I think what we're, we're want to do is is hear from the public about why this would really benefit the town um so that that was kind of my my first question is what what are we doing to involve the prop current property owners uh to provide feedback as well um so they um current property owners um 
you know, got notified as a, along with um, flyers went to business owners um, uh, that were open, at least in that area. Um, so, and, and we'll just continue to reach out as best we can. I would just add, I think at the February um, forum we had on this, there were a lot, I thought a good turnout of uh, business owners from the area that turned out for it. So that was good. And I would just clarify that the, the example that I, I, I showed, um, there, that kind of whole cluster of areas was four parcels, but the um, kind of that heavy outline of the existing conditions, um, I believe those two parcels are under common ownership. So that's why I chose it like that and kind of left the other two, you know, as is. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of the uh, timeline, we're going we're gonna to provide Chris feedback today. Um, and it sounds like we're, we are going to have your email address and, and citizens can continue to email you uh, as they have ideas. Kind of what's your deadline for you know collecting that input and what's your timeline for providing the next steps um my suggestion would be you know we have a we leave the presentation and receive comments for a couple weeks see you know what we have in um and at that point ella and i can can see what we need to change um in terms of what i presented tonight i think it'll be fairly soon after that that we can have a draft of, of a full report to, to elizabeth for distribution and at that point, I think then we would be turning on um, into a draft of the bylaw. And then I mean, of course we'd be coming back when we have, when we have something to show you on that. So my, my suggestion would be two weeks, but I'm open to what Elizabeth or you think on that. That's fine. I actually just kind of wanted a general idea so that the public could kind of hear, we're not talking about that next year, you're gonna have redevelopment there by any means. Right. Um, you know, so it, you'd be providing a draft bylaws for the board to think about and, uh, in conceivably, uh, Elizabeth, would those possibly be, if, if the board liked them and had time to get comments, would those possibly be uh, bylaws for the proposals for the 2021 town meeting? Or is it likely that those would be 2022? I, for something of, of this scale, as far as um, the level of zoning bylaw amendments. Um, you're talking about typically our town meeting warrant closes by December. So right. no, I don't. Okay. I don't think this is town meeting 2021. And um, I just think that's helpful for people to hear. You know, so there's there's time to continue to kind of get input and things like that. Oh, so. they're correct. So um, you know, it's the end of June. No. Okay, um, so you that's could, you could develop zoning in the next two months and and it would not be sufficient for um, public participation education um, to have it be on the close by the end of the warrant at the end of December. Okay, great. So I just want everybody to who's listening to know that this is that longer longer range plan um, for that area. So, you know, uh, let's make sure that, you know, with your comments and suggestions, that's keeping in mind. So Elizabeth, I'm seeing some good questions um, in the Q&A. Should I, I, I know that you were able to answer some of them, should, uh, and especially if people have questions about where are they gonna see the plans, um, the plans that uh, the presentation that Chris had is gonna be posted on the planning board site. So look for that. And a reminder that the presentation is that high level hypothetical example. Um, and so it doesn't have details necessarily um, about what's going to go there right now, um, and, you know, including, you know, parking and, and, and things like that. So would it be helpful for the open questions if I read the ones that were typed in first and we tried to answer them? And then we can open it up to folks that typed in their name and we can call on them in case they want to be unmuted. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, the first question I see is, uh, Diane Proctor, 57 Sudbury Road. The question of parking is already a crucial one in town. Given the hypothetical design, it seems that available parking would be diminished. I realize it's hypothetical, but I hope this issue is at attended to very carefully. So that's a comment. And I think Chris, if I understand correctly, um, what we would do address in the zoning bylaws is the the parking to go in that in that district right and we could make changes to it based on best practices for shared parking etc so that that would come in the in the bylaw phase exactly yes okay mm -hmm. 
Um, uh, Joe Stein and Joe, I know your address, I saw a couple ones. Um, Joe Stein on Thoreau Street. The proposed height of the buildings is absolutely and completely out of scale for the community. I suggest one and a half to two and a half floor max. This is not preserving Concord as you suggested as goal from the outset. I was at the open house and I don't think these heights were consistent with the feedback you received. Do you think that has to do with um, thinking about the two districts that you're, you know, sub districts you're proposing, Thoreau Street and then the Thoreau Marketplace? Uh, I, I think that that might be the case, you know, along Thoreau Street where you have single story buildings. I think that is an area where we would probably, we would want lower heights probably than others. Um, you know, in terms of the hypothetical um, that we showed, I think these were quite consistent with the feedback that we got from the visual preference survey. People were pretty comfortable with three and a half to um, stories, um, three to three to three and a half stories. So um, that was sort of why we sort of presented um, it in that way. But I think some parts especially would, would certainly be lower scale. And that was why I was suggesting sort of two sub districts to, to, to take that into account. Yeah, there are existing two and a half story buildings, the, the one with uh, Chang'an and the one with Farfalla Market. They're, they're both, and also even the one with the olive oil store that's right on Thoreau Street, uh, on, on Sudbury right. Road, right in front of Crosby's Market. That's a two and a half story. Well, so, you know, I think that we were looking at some increased density, but I think that that also, it's a kind of incremental uh, increase in density and I mean, it is one of the kind of uh, principles that we have been pursuing um, is right near right near commuter centers, you know, that that, that is a, a smart growth principle. If I may just add to this is Ella from MAPC, that the existing zoning, what's already on the books, allows for 35 feet in height. So the hypothetical example might show something, um, some change to the existing conditions but actually the zoning, what would change would be very slight. Already what's on the books allows for 35 feet. All right, um, I see a question from Candace Root, 139 Belknap, Belknap Street. The communication was not broad for this meeting. Our behind the depot neighborhood was not informed. The message was on Facebook, but many of our neighbors are not on Facebook. Um, and so, Again, we'll post this presentation to the website and the email address to pursue comments. And this is going to be part of a, a longer conversation where we start talking about the draft bylaws based on the vision. And I think it's important for folks to comment on the vision. And um, so if there's other suggestions about how to get the word out as well to comment on this vision part, because that's going to inform the, the bylaw recommendations, there certainly be you know, uh, I'm not going to say this correctly, uh, Elizabeth, public comment on the, on the, when we get to the bylaws and drafting of those or public hearings? Um, yep. So, um, you know, there's, there's uh, only so, so much we can do as far as, you know, getting the word out. So what um, did happen is um, that the, there was a flyer that got posted. It did go out on news and notices. Um, so anything associated with this project, uh, if people have not signed up for news and notices on the main page from the uh, town's website, I'd suggest you do that. Um, there was uh, a poster in Monument Square, a sandwich board sign in Monument Square, a sandwich board sign right at the entrance to Crosby's Market. Um, and there, uh, um, a Blurb went to our public information officer who, you know, sent that out as far as um, our other social media and sent it to the paper. Um, and unfortunately, um, nine times out of 10, when we send something to the paper, it, it, we don't know if it's gonna make it in or not. So, um, but I would strongly suggest people sign up for news and notices and anything with this project um, does immediately go out on that and it does get posted to the website. Thank you. Um, I see a comment from Sue Felshin, 19 Sunnyside Lane. Um, what is the vision for distinguishing the Thoreau District sub the Thoreau District sub district from the Thoreau Marketplace sub district? Is it small versus large? 
If so, it seems that parcel 0629, which is the copy shop, et cetera, and behind it to the Concord Crossing development could support a taller and more massive high spine without overshadowing the Rose Street, the train tracks, the private housing to the Southwest or the private housing to the Northwest beyond parcel 0625. That area isn't likely to be redeveloped anytime soon, but as you have noted, the point is to get zoning in place well before it is needed. Um, well, I, I guess, you know, that that's, it's good feedback. I think the, the sort of where we've kind of tentatively drawn the lines of the subdistricts um, could, could certainly change based upon feedback. Um, you know, this is, this is an art. So if, if people feel like the, where the, the subdistrict lines are, are drawn, because I think that is the case that um, one of these subdistricts would have more requirements as it related to open space and potentially allow for some higher buildings and maybe even different uses. Um, so we can, we can think about and, and refine where those district lines are, are made. Um, and another following up, um, Joe Stein Thoreau Street was saying that it, I believe is saying in the February meeting, um, they, uh, he felt they were asked about aesthetics, but not height. So we, we realized that height is going to be something that is, is discussed as we kind of continue this. Yeah, I, would, I mean, we, we tried to get at the height answer from the um, from that visual preference survey because we tried to say what are these buildings that you like, but uh, you know, people might have interpreted them wrong. Again, this is sort of in art, um, as not as much a science. So if, if the height's not right, then that's what we'll work on and, and refine that and make sure that everyone's comfortable with or, or is, try to come to some consensus on that. Okay. Um, and then uh, Diane Proctor. 57 Sudbury Road again. I think supporting the community commuting aspect of the town is crucial. The train depot is not really so much a challenge as an asset. The train draws young families who want to live in Concord but work in Boston, Cambridge. Finding uh, ways to increase parking for those citizens could be a real asset. Um, now that, that's an interesting twist on it because I think we were, we were hoping that um, the less parking would be necessary that you know we are going to have folks that are have that walkability now and um and and just hop right on the train and, and don't need as much parking so I guess there's yeah i mean we've mepc has done a lot of research um there's a if you go to perfect fit parking um you know they, they examined a number of communities um and around train stations and we find a very strong correlation in terms of the utilization of residential parking it has to do with how close you are to transit and people that do live closer to transit you um, tend to not need as much um, obviously in a place like again as i mentioned this isn't a type of situation where you can get away with no parking like you you might in you know boston but for example if you have a, a one bedroom and you're a couple um, and you one of you works in boston you might only need one car instead of two cars so you only have to build one parking space instead of two parking spaces which i believe your bylaw today requires two spaces per per unit so um that, that's when we say that we're looking to sort of right size it um, um the other thing just to keep in mind in terms of parking is it's it takes up a lot of room. Um, it's a lot of essentially wasted space if you don't need it. Um, and so if you want to create that vibrant walkable area, you want to have enough parking for the residents, but you don't want to have more than you need. Right, especially kind of with the direction that the town is going in terms of sustainability and resilience and um, an impervious surface. So I believe those were all the written comments, but there is someone who uh, wrote in Actually, I think I have one more. I'll get to that one in just a moment. Oh, no, I've got a couple more, but let me go to Rich Napolitano from 340 Main Street. Elizabeth, are you able to unmute Rich and, and maybe he can provide his comment on audio? Rich, you'll probably see an invitation that says the host has invited you to unmute yourself. So give that a try. Can you hear me? Yes. Well, thank you for the presentation. I. I uh, really enjoyed it. the um, bird's eye views. They were very helpful. Uh, the question is, uh, we talked about uh, different kinds of housing, but are there accommodations being made for the elderly uh, and uh, creating mixed use where people can live, work, et cetera, uh, in the community? Yeah, that's, that's something, you know, we can think about ways to ensure that when you say elderly, I, I, I'm guessing you mean that to ensure that they're sort of accessible. So, you know, that there's elevators and things like that. Um, that that's something that we can um, look into. Um, I think maybe if I had a little more clarification in terms of what you're sort of when you say housing for the elderly, um, you know, what's on your mind related to that? 
So for retirees, um, as they as their children children go off, they're looking to downsize into smaller accommodations. Yeah, right. So that's that. This is exactly the type of housing that sort of attracts. You know, I think the two groups that this would be attractive to, for the most part, is going to be. Um, I think somebody mentioned sort of the maybe younger professionals who are commuting to Boston. They have no kids, so that's the one end of the spectrum. The other end are the empty nesters. So they want to stay in the community, but you don't need your 3,500, 4,000, whatever it is, square foot home anymore. Um, and it, maybe you don't want to also have to drive all the time. So now you want to live in this sort of a smaller location where you know probably someone's going to do the shoveling for you. Um, and, and you can just walk to the coffee shop and things like that. that. I think this is sort of the ideal type of housing for that. And then that frees up um, the single family home that then for, for a family to sort of um, now settle in into Concord. That was the question and you have your first customer. <laughs> Thanks, Rich. We will probably um, mute you again, but folks, if anybody has a comment that they'd like to make um, uh, so we can hear you, please type your name and address into the Q&A. And then when I get to that one, uh, we can unmute you just like that. I'm still reading a few more. So if this method is going okay, I'm gonna continue. If you'd like me to change the method, let me know. Um, Suzanne Rutstein, resident from Concord Turnpike and retail tenant on Thoreau Street. If there was a bylaw change, would it be enforced for renovations on existing structures or is it only for new construction? That's one question Then she's got a follow up. Uh, if new regulations were to be followed with renovations, would interior renovations be subject to changing exterior appearances? And if so, at what percentage scope of renovation? This might be, I don't know, Elizabeth, if, if this is something that you might be able to answer as it might pertain more particularly to the Concord's bylaws. Um, so currently interior renovations, um, well, Currently, there are there are no requirements in the throw business district as far as um, requiring design element changes to the exterior of a building unless um, somebody triggers a, a level of site plan approval where they need to make exterior modifications. But there are no um, design guidelines or um, requirements currently in the zoning bylaw dealing with the you know what the exterior elevation looks like uh, to what Chris was talking about um, and then you know whether uh, a new zoning bylaw deals with um, requiring any type of exterior um, changes for renovations I, mean, I guess that's something that could be discussed but um, currently there's no requirements one thing that I'm, I'm working on uh, an ordinance uh, up in Salem and one of the things that we are doing that I think relates to this question is for existing uses existing businesses um, we're allow we're you know if they want to for example expand their their space but keep their business and don't want to sort of obviously knock down the building to be conforming with the zoning um, is, is there was some provision to say you can expand your business by X percent um, for, for existing businesses that when this ordinance was created are not subject to the requirements of, of the bylaw. So we, we could put something like that in so that people can feel sort of comfort and safety that they don't need to worry about following the whole bylaw just for making some minor modifications. Thank you. Um, I see one from Bonnie Albright, 307 Main Street. I agree with the previous person, and sorry, because they're a little out of order, but I agree with the person about the commuter rail. We should do our part to encourage the use of our commuter rail as it can increase commuting for people outside our town, perhaps a lower level parking garage. And so it seems like that's something. Um, ha do parking structures um, come into play with zoning bylaws? Not, not typically. I mean, I think it's really important to remember how much parking costs. Um, and at, if you're doing structured parking, you're probably looking at $25,000 per parking space um, on average. So they add a tremendous amount of cost. Um, I often do see um, 
uh, structured parking associated with a residential development um, as they, if they are developments of a certain size. And I, I've spoken to um, some people of the development community asking sort of what, how, what, where's the level that this can pencil out? And, and the answer that I get is it really just depends on how much it takes for them to purchase the land. And, and that's the main driver. Um, you know, this comment, it's, it's sounding like this person is, um, you know, encouraging people from outside of Concord to come into to this area. I, I don't know of any area within this, um, within this neighborhood where there would be the room to put a, a publicly accessible garage for commuting. Um, in this case, I think there are other commuter rail stations. I think this commuter rail station is really the type of place that's an asset for people within who live within Concord itself. I, I don't see um, a high number of people being able to drive here. Um, you know, I think Littleton, for example, has a, a fairly large station um, and close to the highway. Um, I don't think that would be the case here. Okay. And I see one more uh, comment. It's from Zur Ateas, 48 Thoreau Street. I think that the ideas proposed offer immense hope for the future needs of our growing community. I believe in the vision and support mission. We need so much of what is being proposed more residential housing around the commuter rail makes so much sense. There is a need for more diverse retail and we need to meet the needs of our ever-growing community and increasing the walkability of our downtown district is essential. Do you envision a more Main Street feel on Thoreau Street? I, I think so. I mean, that's, I very much appreciate those comments and I think that's sort of the nail on the head um, for everything that was said. I think the, the hope is that as redevelopment takes place that, you know, it will be a vibrant sort of commercial sector with, with uh, housing um, typically above the, the commercial buildings. And, and I think that in terms of, you know, a main street feel, I think that there's a, there's a number of elements that have that go into that, that people think about trees and, and things that we're just are, it's a comfortable place that people want to walk. And I think those can all take place in terms of the future vision um, for, for Thoreau Street as well as Sudbury. Okay, um, those were all the comments that I see typed in the Q&A and all of the names for folks that wanted to speak up. Uh, so let me just put that out there for, for one more minute. If you have not had your question answered, if you have thought of something, please put that in so we can make sure to, to hear. And again, you will have the email address and the presentation so you can follow up to Chris by email with other questions and suggestions so they can incorporate all of that in their uh, report that they're going to provide to Elizabeth and the planning department. So, uh, Chris and I would, will add um, when this meeting is over, um, you know, I will be posting Chris's presentation uh, to the planning board's webpage so people can look at it in a little bit more detail and um, provide comments. Um, I think we are looking for comments um, by July 10th um, for this project. All right. Anything else from the board? Any other questions or things for Chris and Ella to take back? Yeah, I had a, a question about legally, how does a sub sub district work? I mean, my understanding has always been that zoning has to be uniform within a zoning district. So I, I don't, I'm not familiar with sub districts. Is that an actual construction of, of zoning bylaw that I'm, I'm just not aware of because we haven't had them? Um, you know, I guess I, I don't know any issues related to legality. Um, all that I can say is, you know, we have precedents within Massachusetts. As you know, every bylaw that gets adopted from a town has to go to the attorney general for her approval. Um, and, and she has been approving a number of these. I'm happy to give some, give okay, some. Okay, it may just be, we just haven't had sub districts. That's all. Yeah. It could also be a, a definition thing where maybe we call them sub districts, but technically they're they're separate. This is their zoning districts that are distinct, but you know I, I don't know what the actual definition between a sub district and a zoning district is. But I, I can look into that for you because I think that's a good question that I should know. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. Seeing no other questions, we really appreciate your your time, Ella and Chris. And Chris, happy anniversary. Thanks for, thanks for spending part of it with us. Sure. Thanks for having me tonight. All right. Yeah. Thanks, All right. We, we, will, we will look forward to that project. I'll, I'll let you guys go. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye. All right. Um, we 
do have another agenda item for 8.30. It's about 8.10 right now, so we can um, take care of some other things before then. Can we do our administrative business uh, while we are waiting till for the clock? Do you wanna to go to the uh, approval not required plan? Give me two seconds and I will bring it up. Okay, uh, everybody can see the screen. Yes. Um, so this is uh, 196 210 Park Lane. Um, and um, what the plan shows is this area, um, portion of parcel 16A is being conveyed over to parcel 17. Um, so the Recommendation is that the board endorse this plan as an approval not required because it is changing the size and configuration of the lot, um, but it is not affecting the frontage. Uh, both parcels will have more than 40,000 square feet of area and um, 150 feet of frontage. Okay, is there a motion? You, somebody might be muted if you're making a motion. Kristen, I'm just looking for the uh, the. Oh, the memo. Yep. Can you give me a second. I got it. Oh, take it away. All right. Uh, the planning board should move to endorse the plan for James and Elizabeth uh, and Ms. Sulis and 210 Park Lane LLC for 196 and 210 Park Lane dated June 8, 2020, as approval not required because the plan is not a subdivision because it shows proposed conveyance, which changes the size and shape of the lots in such a manner that frontage is not affected and authorize the chair, clerk, or town planner to endorse the plan. Is there a second? Second. Burton seconds, okay. I'm gonna do a, a roll call. Um, <clears throat> Mr. Saya. Yes. Ms. Orbital? Yes. Mr. Bosdet? Yes. Mr. Flint? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yep. And this is Ms. Ferguson, yes. All right. Um, moving right along. Shall we tackle the uh, goals and projects for the upcoming year? Or maybe knock out the minutes. We could do the minutes. That should be easy. So we've got um, the minutes from June 9th and the correction from uh, last November 26th. <clears throat> Did anybody have any questions or comments on the June 9th minutes? Yes, I, I had one, um, which was uh, section uh, 10. Oh, no, sorry, that's in our report. Never mind. Uh, no, the, the minutes are fine. All right, let's do, um, let's do the June 9th minutes. Is there a motion to accept the minutes? Yeah, I move that we accept the minutes of June 9th, uh, 2020 as written. Is there a second? Okay, that's Nathan seconding. All right, I'm gonna go around again. Mr. Saya? Yes. Ms. Orbital? Yes. Mr. Bosdet? Yes. Mr. Flint? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. And Kristen Ferguson, yes. And then the other minutes, we needed to make a correction to the, min uh, to the minutes for November 26, 2019. I apologize. <laughs> so 
So it looks like the correction should be to reflect that the attendees did not include Mr. Saya and that Mr. Flint was present. So, so the minute should correctly reflect that present at the meeting on November 26, 2019 was Mr. Johnson, Mr. Flint, Ms. McEnany, Ms. Ferguson, and Mr. Bosdett. So if we can get that corrected, um, is there, um, I, I, move I, that we, I move that we <laughs> correct the minutes as stated by Ms. Ferguson. Okay, I second. Uh, Mr. Saya. Yes. Okay, Ms. Orvidal. Yes. Mr. Bosdett. Yes. Mr. Flint. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. And Ms. Ferguson says yes too. So that should take care of all of the minutes. And then um, the last thing, uh, we've got a little time for goals and projects. We could also do, um, this is before 8.30, um, we could also do um, any updates that people have from different committees or things like that. But uh, how much time do we think we're gonna spend on the goals? Uh, Elizabeth sent out a memo and um, we, you know, we wanna discuss it to some degree, but uh, had well, folks, I think, go ahead. Yeah, I think you can start discussing the goals memo and then at 8.30, just go to your um, next item. So, okay. um, so yeah, the board, the board did receive um, a draft um, memo. The one item that I completely forgot um, to add and it was pointed out is um, that needs to be added for your projects for next year is updating the tree preservation bylaw um, based on the memo that the board received from Davy Tree, who's the reviewing agent. Um, so that, that also needs to be included um, in this memo. Uh, have folks had a chance to look at the I goals? I also wondered about the housing production plan, Elizabeth. The, we have a housing production plan update that is due. Um, so that's, um, that's something that um, the DPLM director works directly with our regional housing services planners on. Um, and so I'm not sure where that is in, uh, in the mix, whether it's in line to be updated in the coming year or not. Um, that's part of what their contractual services are. So I don't know what the, I don't know what their projects are for the next coming year. Um, at this point yet. Yeah. I heard a rumor that they would come in February or something like that. Um, that that may be um, and um, so it's it's not a project that the planning board initiates or um, you know if the regional housing service office uh, does begin an update on the housing production plan um, it will come to the planning board for comments, the select board for comments, it'll go out for public comment. Um, so it'll be part of that whole public comment process, but it, it won't be a project that's initiated by the planning board. Matt, were you thinking that that was going to change some of the goals or in, inform some of the goals? Well, I thought that, uh, first of all, I think we have to endorse the housing production plan, right? Or approve it. I guess it's approve it. Um, and then there's a question of whether we want to weigh in, you know, I mean, we, I shouldn't say we, <laughs> it probably won't be me, but you know, it, whether the board, you know, has any input on housing production, because I mean, it is kind of within our purview, even if there is different staff that's, that's producing uh, the plan. So I guess, you know, I'm just thinking back uh, to the last time this was done in 2010. Um, and, and the board's input would would be with um, zoning bylaw amendments? Well, it's also just, you know, with regards to policy, you know, I mean, around housing production, I mean, we're, we're trying to have a position on affordable housing, uh, on just uh, affordability of housing in general and housing production, I, I think. So I guess there, we could be more proactive or less, but it's just, uh, I think, something that is likely to happen, oh, sorry, that in the next, uh, in the next year, the uh, fiscal year. So the, the last plan was done 2015. Oh, okay. Sorry. It's a five year, every five years, not 10. Yeah. Um, 
All right, so hold that thought. I want to I want to come back to that because I had a question about that too. But um, based on the document that Elizabeth sent out and the proposed goals, uh, what initial feedback to people feel? Uh, did we feel that we've included uh, the right goals? Have we included um, all of the goals that we want to? And um, I believe this is Haley. Is this the first time you're you're seeing this goals document? Like, um, like this is your first time going through this process, right? Where the planning board sets goals. And we talked about it at the last meeting, but you know, so each year um, around this time, around kind of the beginning of the term of, of the new person um, or the new, the new member, we, we set goals for the coming year. And, and what Elizabeth does is she kind of puts together uh, one, an update on what we have done on our goals that we had for the previous year and, and where we are with that. And then based on kind of our discussions, and we started this at the last meeting, what are our goals for this year so that we can work towards those? Because as you know, she reminds us, any, any kind of zoning bylaws that we're proposing, any kind of changes that are going to be in for town meeting of the following year really have to be done by, um, uh, you know, in by the end of this calendar year, which means we kind of work backward to, to work on those. So setting the goals now is important for just getting everything done by this time next year. Um, we're also taking into account the long range planning um, report uh, and, and you'll see that that's one of the goals in there is to, to take a closer look at that as well as some of the things that we've been working on for a little while. But <clears throat> does anybody oh. see that we've missed any? Go ahead. Um, Kristen, so on the housing production plan, um, Marsha is available to um, give a little bit more detail um, on that. There you go. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, just some of the thinking on the planned production, the planned housing production plan is that the numbers all change in 2021. The census is being taken now and when we have those new numbers, we'll know where, where we're falling short or where we're going. And so it, to me, it did not make sense to, there was no benefit in moving forward with uh, uh, updating the housing production plan in 2020 when we knew everything was going to change in 2021. So I will be seeking funds, uh, additional funds from the Community Preservation Committee uh, in the coming year so that we can begin that process after we have the new numbers from HUD uh, that will give us new information about housing in the community. And that's why it's been delayed by a year or postponed for a year. Um, again, it had no impact on our current numbers and it has no impact on whether things move forward or not um, with regard to Junction Village. Thanks, that's it, <laughs> unless you have questions. Thanks. Thank you, Marsha. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one of the open questions around the goals is that that very big item, which is that comprehensive long range plan and, you know, the list of things. And I guess maybe it's too early, but, you know, there is the opportunity to have the discussion on the, this. I just made a two slide summary of all of the different uh, action items for us, um, you know, that were in there that we could potentially work on. And clearly it's way too many things to, to work on. Um, and in some cases we've moved on. Um, and then, you know, some of them I did not include because they're ones we've already actually accomplished. Um, so I could distribute this and maybe in a you know future meeting or maybe uh, Elizabeth might have even a more, I mean, she's, she sent out the detailed matrix, but I, I thought, well, it's a very big thing to go through. And this just you know, boils it down to just, okay, uh, you know, we can sort of uh, pick off the list, you know, things that are worthy of discussion and then, um, you know, maybe drill into them a little bit deeper as to, okay, is there one or two of these that we could pick off or that you guys could pick off for this coming fiscal year and take them on, take it on, you know, and some of them we've heard like tonight we may get a kind of a pilot project around form-based code in terms of the zoning proposals for the thorough depot district, but, uh, and, and we, it sounds like housing production plan will be put off. Um, so, you know, that helps narrow it down. 
but uh, you know, some of these others uh, may be may be worth uh, taking a look at. So just I just wanted to put that out there um, as, as a, a potential way to structure that discussion. And again, maybe next time, not tonight. Matt, I think the point stands though that 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 long range plan is, a, is sort of a rich vein to mine. Uh, and I think by having it on there as one of our our goals for the next, you know, at least the next year, probably the next three or four years, <laughs> three to four yeah. to punch through those items. Um, uh, uh, I mean, I, I see that as our biggest item after the the uh, the Thoreau Depot work. Uh, the one the one common Kristen I wanted to raise was that is that uh, the correspondence we received uh, earlier today on uh, the uh, I believe the term was preservation districts or um, uh, and, and Elizabeth you know I, I guess I, when I read that I was wondering are there any of those in town what do those look like um, and and which what should we be thinking about as we as we read that that uh, citizen's letter. Um, yeah, so uh, Kristen, it, if you have it, it um, should actually be uh, read into the record. Um, but I'm, there are there are no neighborhood conservation districts in town outside of um, the Historic Districts Commission um, as far as limiting, you know, the you know, the size of dwellings and, um, and, you know, the style or aesthetics or, or anything like that. So, um, you know, the letter came from a resident in a nurse Knack Hill. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and looking to, I mean, they do have a homeowners association, you know, in that area, but, um, there's no provisions for, um, limiting the size of homes or redevelopment in that neighborhood. Okay, so, so that was, your sense of the letter was that they were looking for some sort of, histori some sort of historic preservation type of, of overlay or something that might protect the neighborhoods. Okay, all right. Well, uh, um, another, um, I mean, another. there is this notion of a neighborhood conservation district and it, you need the, the bylaw language to create them. We don't currently have that kind of language in our bylaw, but some other nearby towns do. And so, you know, this is some uh, stuff that I more or less plagiarized from uh, Lexington, um, you know, in, in terms of describing what a neighborhood conservation district looks like or how they work, um, you know, and it's kind of like a historic district light uh, and it's, it's neighborhood uh, administered. Um, though you, you create a committee, you know, that, that is basically a neighborhood based to review um, proposals for reconstruction or new construction. Interesting. It almost looks like an after the fact HOA, um, but I guess it gets approved. It gets approved by a town meeting. Right? Okay. Well, a homeowners There's, association has different powers, and yeah, it's typically you know like formed that. at the beginning. Yeah, right. But it but it looks like you get a super majority, and you and they then have a say in and uh, modifications people can make to their properties. Right, but not things like, you know, storm windows and, you know, house color and things like that. So it's not as stringent as a historic district, yeah. But but Matt, was this, were you, in your uh, research, was this a two-part process? Yes, yeah, so one, there's, uh, go ahead. yeah, so you, in the first year, you have to go to town meeting and say, we can create such a thing as a neighborhood conservation district. And then subsequently a group of neighbors has to come and form such a district based upon the bylaw that you pass. So it's kind of a two year long process at a minimum to get one in place. And so that's why I was thinking out of the list of stuff on the long range plan, you know, this is interesting. There are certainly some neighborhoods, I think, you know, a nurse Nag Hill is, is one possibility, but I, I think even more about neighborhoods like uh, around uh, Hubbard Street and Everett and, you know, that area, Middle Street, you know, that those, that they are not within a historic district today. Um, it, they, you know, homeowners may or may not want to opt into a historic district, uh, but, you know, this might be a good model for them. Um, 
There's also, interestingly enough, a group of uh, neighbors that are pursuing a historic district for uh, a group of deck houses on a, on a street called Jenny Duggan Way. So um, there, you could even do a historic district around, you know, mid-century modern if you if you want. It, it's it's becoming historic, um, mm -hmm. but uh, maybe again, a lighter type of model like this might be more appropriate for them. Thanks for that background, Matt. So it's approaching 8.30, we can, we can table this and come right back. But before I do that, um, Elizabeth, do I need to read in the email uh, sent today or sent earlier or on June 16th? Yes. Okay, let me just do that to kind of, if I could just do that with this conversation. It's an email sent by Janet Roth, Rothrock on behalf of a Nursnack Hill neighborhood residents, and she signed all of their names. And if I need to read them all, let me know. It says to the planning board, as many of the houses in our neighborhood now exceed 60 years old, many of us are concerned that the scale and character of our neighborhood be preserved. We understand that the long range plan of 2018 recognizes this as a problem for many neighborhoods in Concord and recommends possibly adopting a conservation district as a remedy. We understand that three neighboring towns, Cambridge, Lexington, and Wellesley have conservation districts and would appreciate the planning board looking into the pros and cons of their experience and how such a provision might work in Concord. Thank you. The Nursnack Hill neighborhood residents. Um, do, should I read all the names? Okay, good. And that was sent on June 16th, 2020. So thank you for sending that and that Elizabeth had sent that to each of us. So that's relevant to what we were just talking about and can impact what we uh, potentially take on for our goals for this year. Kristen, for the next item, I'm going to recuse myself and go on mute and, and turn off my screen. All right, thanks, Britton. All right, so it's uh, it's 8:31, and I believe that our um, our folks are here for the next item of business, which is recommendations to the Zoning Board of Appeals, the application of Now Communities LLC for a special permit under sections 10 and 11.6 of the zoning bylaw for a 14 unit planned residential development at 1651, 1657 and, and 165 X Main Street, parcels 2685, 2686, 2687. Um, our plan is to review the draft recommendation letter Elizabeth prepared and we will take a vote on that. Has everyone had a chance to review the letter that Elizabeth put together that's based on our discussion at the last meeting and we have met with the applicant a few times. Um, I'm gonna say it to the board first, but do, do we also want the applicant to uh, speak? I think, um, I, I think we've heard a lot from you and heard a very informative things. So I don't wanna put you on the spot if we don't do Matt. Go ahead. I was just going to say, I think that we're, I'm, I'm fine with the letter. I just found one typo in uh, section 1027 uh, about the height uh, certification. It was just, the, there seems to be a missing word or two there somewhere. I don't have the wording exactly in front of me, but uh, in just that one paragraph. Uh, sorry, I, I should have had this <laughs> up in front of me when they, I mentioned it. Let's see. You said 10.2.7? Yes. So it's about certifying the height and there, se there seems to be some word missing in there. Um, um, yeah, so uh, the building commissioner has recommended that a condition be incorporated requiring certification of the height prior to sign off. So that's your proposed rewording, right? Yeah, so the missing word is yeah. requiring. Thank you. <laughs> okay, that was my only issue. Any other comments from the board? Okay, I did not have any comments. I thought that you captured everything from, uh, from the previous meetings. And so now I would entertain a a motion to did, did oh. you want to no it's a recommended yeah recommendation go ahead 
Well, did you want to see if the applicant had any questions? Mr. Gainsborough, do you have any questions about the uh, our recommendation letter to the ZBA? I do not. Um, I think I sent a couple uh, uh, clarification to Elizabeth um, uh, in terms of the sale price, but otherwise, um, no. Um, I do want to, if I if I may. Um, I would love to acknowledge, um, and maybe you guys already did this earlier, and if you did, I apologize, but that it's Matt, I think it's Matt's last meeting. No. No, no, thank goodness. No. Matt, Matt doesn't get to leave until after town meeting. You can still acknowledge him and, and the work he's done so far. Uh, that's all right. I definitely want to do that, and um, it's funny because for what it's worth, I, I said what Elizabeth said to Rob, and he said, no, 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 today's his last uh, tonight is the last meeting, so I'm very pleased that you will continue on, um, and 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 not just as it relates to um, what is now called Mill Run Commons, but um, all, uh, all the work that 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 you've done, and I appreciate it. So, thanks, and I'm also very happy not to be chair anymore. <laughs> that. Um, Okay, and then also I wanted to mention that that uh, Mill Run name is interesting. I, I think it's a, or you know, it could be like Riverwalk Mill Run. Yeah, it's like it, it seems more complimentary somehow. Thank you. Um, I have been. I just finished. I don't know. Hang on. I just finished. Well, we'll educate. Um, uh, Mill Run is the actual waterway that comes down that feeds the paddle wheel that runs the mill. That's what that is called. Yes. It's called the mill run. And, and, and for what it's worth, we really wanted to try, try to do something with the name Damon Dale and Westvale, um, but the, um, it, it, were, it, there was, it created too much confusion. So to Elizabeth's point, um, we did a lot of research on that and we feel like, you know, it's either mill race or mill run and we just felt like mill run was a little more um, benign maybe these days. Well, and complimentary to walk. I love it. Great, thank you. <laughs> my my uh, marketing team will be psyched. They're, they're, they're very excited about getting started on it. Good. So thank All right, you. thank you. All right, so now we need to um, now remind me what we're doing. So now that we have the draft, rec or now that we have the letter, and motion. Now I can entertain a motion to uh, approve the letter so that we can make the recommendation to the ZBA. And yeah. so it would be a recommendation to the Board of Appeals um, recommending approval based on the draft letter dated June 24th, 2020 as amended tonight. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Nathan. Nathan verbally seconded. Alan, I would have got you. But you got to <laughs> meet yourself faster. Um, okay, so uh, let's go around and take a vote. Uh, Mr. Saya. Yes. Okay. Mr. Bosdet. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Orbital. Yes. And this is Kristen Ferguson. Yes. So thanks for drafting that letter and thank you, Mr. Gainsborough. We will kind of look forward to watching that pro project progress. Thank you so much. And you all are invited anytime to come visit. Thanks. Okay. All right, Burton, you're welcome to come back and join us. And we can resume the conversation about planning board goals. So we can um, make a little progress on that. And then after that, I think the last things are public comment and any anything from um, any other meeting updates from the board. So picking up where we left off for, for the goals and neighborhood conservation districts, um, did folks have any thoughts on that? Should that be a, a goal? And it could be that the board will um, in, investigate and pursue a potential bylaw to develop a neighborhood conservation district. Is that something that among the other goals 
um, you know, I, I, or something real like it. One of the things we've heard a lot about, and I guess I'd need to go back look and look in the long range plan to see if this is echoed there, is people's concern about mansionization and teardowns and things like that, which I think for, based upon Matt's very quick description, it seems like that uh, that could be one of the things that's addressed and it seems to perhaps be the genesis of the, of the comment. I'm wondering if that could be part of what we're looking at in terms of implementing the long range plan um, or, a, or Elizabeth, otherwise, whether there's something sort of, uh, you know, something where if there's a, you know, this kind of public input to do this, that otherwise wouldn't be uh, on our priority of list if there's a way for that to be um, uh, sort of brought forward other than through this letter tonight. Yeah. So what I'd um, probably um, suggest is, so in, in here you do have as your goal to, you know, to go through all those action items and begin to prioritize. I think the, the, the quick two page chart that uh, Matt put together uh, is great for that goal and at a subsequent meeting have basically have all of the board members take that chart and personally go through and, you know, rank them. And then, you know, we can, you know, consolidate them and then come up with a consensus. And I think as far as whether that's, you know, a one year, two year, three year, you know, or four year time frame out and, and start to um, try to take all of those action items and, and begin to prioritize all of them. I think once an action item gets to, you know, a number one and it's something you want to move forward. I think you should specifically pull it out as a separate item so that people are aware that this has been ele now elevated, you know, to a point where within the next year, this is something that the board is specifically going to be, you know, looking at and addressing, um, you know, and getting, you know, momentum on whether it's, you know, moves forward or, or not. Um, there's there's two things that I took away, one from the long range plan and then one from the recent um, uh, resilience plan that is is out for public comment right now. So I can make a comment on, on those two that's related to this topic. Did anyone else have anything to add in terms of um, items that might be missing from the current list that we want to add on? I would just comment on one that is on there that I think is interesting that the 5G, uh, you know, telecom wireless so you know district uh, plan and i'm curious about the relative roles of the planning board versus the select board in that matter because i've often heard that you know 5g that uh, a lot of the work is in the right of way so it would be more of a select board activity and i i had actually thought in the past that we had kind of deferred action uh, as a planning board on this, assuming that the select board was going to take the lead, though they, they have not acted up until now. Now, with me moving over that way, I'm, I'm just curious, you know, how can we work together or how, who really should be taking the lead on this? I, I, I've heard different, again, again, I'm not an expert on 5G, but I've heard that there are different models, some that, you know, operate more using the kind of uh, existing tower infrastructure uh, but others that, you know, they're light posts and building sides and things like that. So uh, I didn't know if anybody, you know, from the town could comment, but uh, I am curious how we actually do move forward in this area because it does seem like one that has been pending for some time and hasn't gotten any action yet. So this was somewhat discussed last year when it was on the list again last year. Um, you know, the planning board doesn't, doesn't have funds, um, doesn't have a budget to move forward with that type of, um, you know, significant consulting that would be needed to try and address the whole, you know, 5G. And when you talk about, you know, the realm of the select board, it's, um, I think it goes beyond whether just, you know, 5G, you know, they, they really want to be within, you know, shorter distances and within road right of ways. Um, there, there's definitely a much broader public um, policy uh, discussion that needs to happen. And, and I think 
that public policy is definitely something that starts with you know the select board and pulls in you know it would pull in the planning board um, you're talking about right of way it would pull in the public's work public works commission um, it would have to you know if we're talking about um, utilities it, you know you may have to pull in the light board you may um, we have you know five historic districts you'd have to pull in the historic districts commission um, so i think from that perspective it's it's a very broad community discussion um, that you know I as the town planner don't believe that it's you know that that's something that needs to start with the select board and um, move through the entire community so I wasn't clear when I read this one whether there was an actual measurable goal for the planning board um, it seems like you know it's initiative as as you're saying to to be undertaken at, at you know a high level in combination with multiple multiple committee multiple boards or committees but um it, is this something that we can put a goal to like it doesn't seem like the goal is to propose an amendment to the wireless overlay district because we won't have that information right and so but the other the only other thing i saw was that um the planning board could work with the select board and town manager to obtain funding for an outside consultant, but I'm not aware that the planning board actually takes that role to to help you know seek funds. You know what I'm saying? So I I although I think it is something that is being looked at, I I'm not clear what the planning board is is doing that we can measure and see where we have arrived this time next year. Agreed. So it, it may it may be something that you take off your immediate goals list and um, you know just urge the you know the select board to be, you know begin to have this you know townwide public policy um, question begin to have that discussion. I can hardly wait. <laughs> And, and so I see that what, and what we do, you know, Haley, especially because this is kind of the first time, you know, you can see that Elizabeth prepared this memo, we're going to comment on it and, and make it the way that we all agree to, because these are goals that we want to work together um, towards for, as a board. But then we are sending this to the select board so that they know what we're working towards. So, you know, if we were to remove number seven, um, this one, then they may not be aware that this is something that we do believe is something for them to work on as well. I'm just trying to think about how to, if this is really on our, our goals sheet, you know, how to make this into a goal that we could actually, an, an actionable goal, I guess. And if it's that our goal is to make the select board aware that, you know, this is a something that we feel important about. I mean, maybe that's just a well, comment do, that we make on there, so. You do have, um, two select board members um, are uh, in attendance for this meeting right now and one um, soon to be select board member in attendance right. so uh, I, I think this discussion you have you have three select board members who are aware <laughs> so, that uh, this is something that the board feels that they should be um, looking into so I, I would propose, you know, these these uh, reliable select board members taking this back to their um, their board, which I know they will, and removing this from our our goals for this year. Does anyone feel otherwise? Okay, so now that opens up more room to take more goals on, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. um, no, so so. so far so far we've added um, the tree bylaw update which that right. needs to be added um, and then uh, whether there's a consensus to look more uh, closely at neighborhood conservation districts um, or not um, and then um, lastly um, something that was also not um, is um, somewhat of the, the same vein as whether there's a measurable goal um, dealing with the West Concord design guidelines and the West Concord business industrial village 
zoning districts. Um, the board's had this discussion a couple of times uh, and ultimately the, you know, the outcome being that um, would like that initiative to begin with the West Concord Advisory Committee and then have them come to the planning board um, you know, with some type of uh, proposal or um, discussion. So um, again, that, you know, that may not be something that is specifically listed on your goals, mem um, your goals memo to the select board and maybe it is just um, a memo from the planning board to the West Concord Advisory Committee for them to discuss at their next meeting um, saying, you know, this was on our radar last year. And we just want to make sure that it doesn't fall off the radar and um, and ask them to have a discussion about that at their meeting and then, you know, come back to the planning board with any um, specific ideas or items um, fairly soon. Again, um, this was something that happened with last year. Things kind of come too late and um, the board doesn't have the ability to properly have a full discussion before you, you're talking about trying to develop something for the warrant. So um, that's something that the, you know, the board could do and, um, and just send a memo directly to the West Concord Advisory Committee saying, we just don't want this to fall off the radar and you know, this is something you wanna move forward with, please talk about it and then come back to the planning board. Now, Matt, you were, I think you were the li liaison between the planning board and the West Concord uh, Advisory Committee. And we're going to need a new one. That's, yeah. that's what I was wondering. Um, are, are there, is there anyone on the call? And, and why don't you describe what that involves, please? Well, I think it's attending the monthly meetings and then also providing information from the planning board, given that the West Concord Advisory Committee is the subcommittee of the planning board uh, you know, to try to coordinate their activities, um, you know, so messages just like this one we just discussed, conveying kind of our, our views on this, um, and uh, then bringing back uh, to the planning board the, you know, updates. Now, clearly, we do have liaisons that do attend sometimes and do sometimes report to the board, but I think for the sake of continuity, it's, it's very good to have someone that is uh, a member that is attending that to that. Um, so uh, I, I think too, the other thing that you get in the West Concord Advisory Committee as the liaison is you get an early peek at development proposals. In many cases, um, a project is first presented if it's happening in that district to the West Concord Advisory Committee and then later comes to us and the opportunity to give feedback, uh, you know, you see the public's reaction and, and everything. It, there's much more public feedback, I would say, in that forum um, on, on the whole. And uh, by the time that proposals get to us, they, they definitely have typically been vetted quite a bit, um, which it shows that, again, for development in that district, it's just good to have an ear to the ground, uh, you know, by being a, a liaison, so. And I, I'd say that I've probably been a liaison too long, so it would really be good to get some new blood into that. So that's another thing. Do we have any volunteers who have the capacity to take that on? It sounds like a, a monthly meeting um, that really uh, will provide some good continuity between the, the two groups. Um, Kristen, it yep. might be good for your um, next meeting. We can, can put together a list of the, um, different um, boards Perfect. and committees that the planning board does have a liaison on and you can go through and because like I know Burton is the actual appointee for the planning board to the um, community preservation committee until 2021 I think right Burton okay well I still so, saw Haley well, volunteer so she can't she can't get out of it now but yes <laughs> Let's, let's put that together. Oh, did, um, Haley, did Haley volunteer? Yeah, I just heard, saw her hand raised. It, it also, by the way, the West Concord Advisory Committee has a meeting July 1st. July 1st. Uh, yeah, we're coming right up. I mean, you know, I can attend, but it'd be neat if you could, too. Yeah, I can do it. They, they also have a pretty good uh, holiday party. I, I oh, yeah. Oh, definitely. Oh, yeah. Um, 
Okay, yeah, so let's look at the other, uh, Elizabeth, the other liaisons, and we'll get that ready for next meeting. Thank you very much. And, um, Hallie, um, Nancy will send you the agenda for the West Concord Advisory Committee and, and Matt, and it has the Zoom link cool. on it. Sounds good. All right. Um, all right, so I guess we would also remove uh, number eight and from our goals. This is going to be an easy year. <laughs> I don't think so. No, I know, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, easy for Elizabeth, but it might be a little lighter on yeah, the rest of the team. Um, um, so was there a consensus to add the Neighborhood Conservation District as a specific project? I'm for it. I think it'd be interesting. I think it could address a lot of what we hear about. Um, I, so I think it, 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 it should get a vetting. Yeah. Alan, Nathan? I'm for it. Um, so the last question would be whether um, the board wants to uh, see the memo one more time at your next meeting, which is July 7th, um, or whether you want to have um, the chair review the memo and send it on behalf of the board. I mean, there's still a few changes that I would like to see in terms of more specificity around the goals for some of them. Um, so I wouldn't mind if, if people looked at those one more time. So for example, the, the new goal that we're adding, you know, it, it doesn't sound like we're necessarily proposing a bylaw, you know, that by the end of this year, we want to you know, have a bylaw, but we want to investigate um, or hold, you know, so I, I want to kind of nail down what we are trying to do to make sure we do that over the course of this year. And and my take on on the issues that we have been hearing about was different, Burton, than this, this one. I, I, I don't think this is a bad thing to undertake. I do think, given the talk about character, um, that I think it would be well received, particularly if we could have more information to present to people and get feedback in the public about what a neighborhood conservation district could be like. So I, I am for adding it, but I'd like us to see it all one more time. Um, and so for example, Burton, when I looked at the long range plan and thought about the comments we've been getting about mansionization and things like that, um, you know, I immediately thought of goal number three under land use 4.4, which was encourage production of small scale affordable and workforce housing that is sustainable, resilient and consistent with town character. Um, to which we have been trying to do some things, uh, you know, the, the warrant articles that we are, are, are trying to move are part of it. But the other thing is, you know, do we want to tackle modifying uh, the floor area ratio? And I don't know if that's something to even like to me i think it would be important to investigate that in response to you know the comments that we're hearing from people i just don't know if that's kind of under the purview of the planning board to say here's what we've seen you know over time and and you know these are the comments that we're getting from people about um, oh well, absolutely i mean it definitely it, you know, it's the zoning bylaw that the planning board put in place. So it makes sense just as with the tree preservation bylaw to review periodically, is it working or not? And I think that Burton was talking about maybe having a broader theme rather than just strictly neighborhood conservation districts. I think he was talking about kind of mansionization as a theme under which, you know, the Floria ratio was one initiative that was done before. Maybe there is a pack package or approach, you know, that either does or doesn't, you know, include one thing or another. Folks, what do other people think about that? So I think, I mean, you can have a more broader um, goal being, um, a, again, that, that general goal that you, I mean, action item that you read, Kristen, and then under there, you know, um, you know, investigate neighborhood conservation districts. Um, analyze the effectiveness of the floor area ratio. Um, and, and both of those could be, you know, projects that the planning board undertakes. Um, what concerns me is um, I don't want there to be an expectation that um, investigating 
a neighborhood conservation district and or analyzing the effectiveness of the floor area ratio automatically um, means that in the next five months you're going to be developing warrant articles for 2021 an annual town meeting so right. um, and i think that's why i think that's why if that's what the the goal says is our goal is to you know identify this and produce a report or something like that to me that is or, or whatever yeah. we want to produce that then that's not saying as opposed to in other cases if we really are trying to generate um a, a bylaw then i think that it should say that in the goal it just helps clarify things for for me on the board what we're working towards um like so for example when i read the thoreau business district redevelopment one which is like our second goal right now um you know, it's it's very clear as after our discussion today that we're we're not talking about in in the next year. So on this document, we're not talking about drafting amendments, um, but that we are, you know, holding. Uh, I think we're holding meetings and things like that. So so that those kind of clarifications, I can try to 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 put in, and and you can see if that grasps what it is. And then if we could have the board review that again one more time, I would appreciate that. Similarly, if other people have suggestions for, for wording that would make the goals more clear, I think I would find that helpful. You know, another example is, you know, for the Crosstown Connect shuttle, the board will begin discussing ways that we can take a more active role in participating. So, you know, you know, are we just generating a list of ways, you know, by next year, we're going to have a list of ways that the board can take an active role or are we actually trying to take actions? And if so, you know, how, how are we measuring if we've achieved this goal, you know, by this time next year? So those are the kinds of things that I'm hoping to get help with, you know, from everybody on the call. Um, perhaps in the next week or two, you can, Elizabeth can send you, I don't know, Elizabeth, can you send out some questions to us and maybe people can respond to your um, email with input? So for example, you know, what should the what should the board really do about Crosstown Connect or something and see if you get any input from each of us that way that you might be able to incorporate in the next draft. Um, well, I, th I think the comments that you um, just made about, you know, being more specific about the, you know, be measuring the goals um, and then have everybody go back um, with this draft memo and just provide me your comments and I will individually just to me, not to the board. Yeah. Um, and um, I will synthesize those in a revised memo and um, send that back out for the board to look at at your next meeting. I like that Every, idea. Everybody okay with that? Yes. Thank you. The other thing that I could do is, you know, that, that two page matrix I had had a column for priority and a column for uh, like, you know, comment. And it's possible that we could distribute that among the members and you yep. could say one, two, three, and then we could add them all up and just see where we're at, you know, in terms of what people's priorities are. Yeah, that would be, that would be great as well. So if Matt. Okay. I'll send the off to you, Elizabeth, uh, copying Kristen and uh, Hey, Matt, distribute. do you do you feel like making yeah. that in spreadsheet format? I think you have it in slides. Do you, can you dump that into a spreadsheet? Because it might be easier to tally information afterwards. Okay, that's a good idea. Yeah, it wouldn't be that hard. Yeah, okay. I'll Thanks do that for putting it now. together. Yeah. Oh, um, no problem. And again, it's possible that I might have missed something. You know, basically, I, I tried to exclude items that we've already actioned. Yeah. Um, you know, like accessory dwellings. Uh, so you know, there may be something I skipped over, so. All right, so our goal is to get this document done by um, hopefully approved at the July 11th meeting or the next meeting so that we can send that memo to the select board and then keep, continue to work. I, I said July 11th because you said that I didn't really look, but. I think your next meeting is July 9th. Oh, July 9th, okay. Um, so that we can start oh, working okay. on those things. Nope. Um, How about at our next meeting? Is it July, no, July 7th. Oh, wow. It's, See, look at Nancy's texting yeah. me, July 7th. <laughs>
at, at our <laughs> next meeting, we'll wrap that up so we can start working toward that. And we'll talk about liaison so we can make sure we're moving forward and um, keeping everything all set. So any other comments on the goals for this year before we move on to the final business? Okay, hearing and seeing none, um, we are going to open it up to general public comments. If anybody had submitted public comments to the planning division, we can um, hear them from Elizabeth. And I believe, and just so I know for the future, at this point, if an attendee wanted to um, speak up, they could, correct? Okay. Yeah. They could just raise. Um, but we did not receive any other public comment other than the one you've already read into the record. Okay. And I'm not seeing any other hands up or comments. So I just had a couple of things from um, my updates. Does anybody have any liaison reports to update about? No. Um, so I just wanted to, to thank Matt for um, being uh, the chair for the last week. I didn't, uh, last year, and I didn't get to uh, start with that in the meeting because you were tardy. I was tardy. <laughs> see, I'm getting lax now that I'm not chair. That? It's like, and, hey. Right, and and we are glad that you're gonna continue on for um, for a couple of months. I know you're excited to start work on, um, on your next board and we're glad you're gonna be on it. So thank you for the work you've done. We're glad that you're gonna continue with us for a bit. Um, a couple of things. Uh, the public information officer is submitting a call for applications for green cards for our planning board and for the ZBA. So uh, we are looking for a new member for uh, the fall or, or for the fall when um, Matt transitions to the select board. Uh, speaking of the fall at the chair breakfast, it sounds like the that town meeting is likely going to be in um, in September. So uh, the town moderator is gonna keep everybody posted by, by doing what she needs to do, which is um, uh, uh, like 30 day increments at a time, but just so that we know um, likely September for the Warren articles. Matt, thank you for preparing that memo and sending it to the select board about the articles that we think are critical for being on this, um, on this town meeting. So we shall stay tuned and hear, for, hear about that. I, I, by the way, the, I did have something in that goals memo at the beginning where um, you were talking about kind of our, our recommendations for town meeting that was kind of a re-summarization of that uh, write-up was that uh, it, I think one new thing that we could do is article 37, which is the thorough depot district boundary. Um, that could potentially go on the consent calendar. It looks like, you know, normally we would want to present it because I, I think that it is significant. It's not something you would normally put on the consent calendar, but this year, um, because of the, you know, expedited nature of the meeting, um, moderators are putting many more articles on the consent calendar than they normally would. The, I think that the, the difference with article 37 uh, compared to the others that we're recommending for the consent calendar is that if somebody asked to pull it off the consent calendar, it's not like the others where we would just say, oh, forget it, we'll just defer. I think we would try to move it, um, you know. And so that I just wanted to add that note, Elizabeth, um, you know. And I had prepared a, actually a more formalized letter uh, to Mike Lawson, though I think, you know, again, we've already conveyed the, the the will of the board to to him based upon our discussion last time, but uh, we could send that more formalized version of the letter. I don't know if it's been distributed to the board, but uh, I sent it in. Uh, and and it, your proposal for the 37 for the consent calendar, you would you send a separate memo to the town moderator? Well, I think I maybe in the latest draft, I did include that one note. Okay, yeah, to the so select board. Already. Yeah, and I'll make sure that I've got it, but if if you guys are okay, I can just send that letter uh, if if it's not already been. Well, I can not, and I can also just include it in the goals memo. That's fine. I think that's all we need because that's a report to the select board anyway, so we're all done. Yeah. So if this article, um, you know, if the Tom moderator does put this article on the consent calendar and somebody does move to have it taken off, the planning board um, 
we'll move forward with a presentation um, on the article. That's right. Okay. Yeah. And, and I did create kind of this, I don't know why I'm in this PowerPoint mood, but um, this, you know, one slide summary again of like green is we're going to move it, but this one's a consent calendar. This one's amend and then move and then the rest are all defer or perhaps consent calendar. And I've shared this with Mike Lawson. All right. Thank you. So just so we've got some time before town meeting, but we will expect to hear back, I guess, about what and it's September can 12th was yeah, the specific when... date. Yeah. Okay. For town meeting, the goal it's okay. not final, but that was the goal September 12th. All right. Well, it'll be a lovely day to be outside that day. And I actually just uh, saw like a video of Carlisle town meeting outside. It looked sunny and it looked like the meeting was about an hour. This, this could be a whole new town meeting concept. Oh, no, <laughs> the town of Harvard had their town meeting outside this past Saturday and only and, under tents, but still it was 90 and only 200 people showed up. So how long did it last? Did you see? I did not see. Okay. No, I just saw that it was an hour long um, recording for the Carlisle town meeting. So I was like, that's efficient. Um, but I think it was very, very, you know, essential articles. Um, so that and just a plug that make sure that everybody saw the, um, I'm going to get it wrong, but the sustainability resilience plan um, that uh, has been worked on and that trying to get some public comment on that. When I read that, I see a lot of goals that have to do with the planning board, um, you know, particularly about electrification of uh, homes and residences and, and things like that. So. I, I think there's there's things to be mined from that as well, although I know that's still kind of moving through whatever uh, approval process it has to move through, but it's still, there's a vision, there's some really aggressive goals um, for greenhouse gas reduction and actions about how they would get there. And I think some of them, some, some many of them have to do with uh, things that we are involved in. So I hope they get some, some good feedback from that. So that's, that's StarMet group uh, has a survey out. Uh, resilience, I think they wanted comments, you know, recently, but, you know, as probably earlier in the week, but I'm, I'm sure uh, any feedback is welcome. And then, you know, we will continue to go through the long range plan and, and pull out things. So I think there should be plenty to work on for next year's chair. No, just kidding. All right, um, if, the, if, if there is no other comment, Okay, I move to adjourn at 9.12. Thank you. Fantastic, Kristen. All right, thanks everybody. See you Great soon. job. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Bye. Good night, everybody.